Chapter Eleven, Section One of J. B. Burry's *The Student's Roman Empire*, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. *The Student's Roman Empire*, Part One, by John Bagnall Burry. Chapter Eleven, Section One. Literature of the Augustan Age Latin Poetry Latin literature was affected seriously and in many ways by the fall of the Republic and the foundation of the Empire. The Augustan Age itself was brilliant, but after the Augustan Age literature rapidly declined. The most conspicuous figures in the world of letters under Augustus had outlived their youth under the Republic. Some of them had served on the losing side but these soon became reconciled to the new order of things. The emperor drew men to himself by virtue of the peace and security which he had established, cunctos dulcedine oti pelexit, and it was his special object to patronize men of literary talent and engage their services for the support of his policy. His efforts were successful. He won not only flattery but sympathy for the new age which he had inaugurated. He enlisted in his cause not only time-servers, but the finest spirits of the day. Although the Augustan literature is certainly marked by a vein of flattery to the court, and by a lack of republican independence, yet we cannot but recognize a genuine enthusiasm for the new age, for the peace which it had brought after the long civil wars, and for the greatness of the Roman Empire. And from a literary point of view, the Augustan age ranks among the most brilliant in the history of the world. Below the Periclean, perhaps below the Elizabethan, but certainly far above that of Louis the Fourteenth. It is true that the cessation of the political life of the Republic necessarily meant the decline of oratory. It is true that historians could no longer treat contemporary events with free and independent criticism. It is true, likewise, that the severe style of old Latin prose begins to degenerate, and that poetry lays aside its popular elements and becomes more strictly artificial. In fact, the poets deprecate popularity and despise the public. Horace's cry, Odi profanum vulgus et arceo, is characteristic of the age. But for literary excellence, and for the perfection of art, the best of the Augustan writers had a clear judgment and a delicate taste. The tendencies of the new age inevitably led to a decline, but as an ample compensation we have Virgil, Horace, Tibullus, Livy. Augustus, as we have said, concerned himself with the promotion of literary activity and the patronage of men of letters. He fostered in all ways the talents of his age. He founded two libraries, one in the portico of Octavia, the other at the temple of Apollo on the Palatine. He was an author himself, both in prose and verse. He wrote Exhortations to Philosophy, and a poem in hexameters entitled Cecilia. The Monumentum Anseranum and the Breviarum Totius Imperi have been mentioned elsewhere. The two chief ministers of Augustus were authors likewise. Agrippa wrote memoirs of his own life, and edited an atlas of the world. Mecenas composed occasional poems of a light nature, and also wrote some prose works but he is more famous as a patron of poets than as a poet himself. His literary circle included Horace, Virgil, Varius, Tuca, Domitius Marsus, besides many lesser names. The orator, M. Valerius Messala, 64 B.C. to 9 A.D., also drew round him a group of men of letters, among whom the most distinguished were the poets Tibullus, Valgius Rufus, Aemilius Masser, and perhaps Ovid. This circle seems to have held quite aloof from politics. Masala's own literary work chiefly consisted in translations from the Greek, both prose and verse. C. Asinius Polio, 75 B.C. to 5 A.D., held a unique position. Having been on the side of Antonius, he withdrew after Actium from political life, and holding himself aloof from the court, devoted himself to literature with a certain independence and perhaps antagonism to the spirit of the age. He was very learned and a very severe critic. He wrote tragedies, which are praised by Virgil, and a history of the civil wars, historiae, 
reaching from 60 to about 42 B.C. He was a friend of both Virgil and Horace. Publius Virgilius Maro was born in 70 B.C. at Andes, near Mantua. His rustic features bore testimony to his humble origin. His father was an artisan. He went to school at Cremona. Afterwards he studied at Medellanum, and finally at Rome, where Octavius, afterwards to be Caesar and Augustus, was his fellow-student in rhetoric. He studied philosophy under the Epicurean Ciro. After his return home, he and his family experienced the calamities of the civil war. Octavius Musa, who was appointed to carry out the distribution of land to veteran soldiers in the district of Carmona, transgressed the limits of that district, and encroached upon the neighboring territory of Mantua, 41 B.C. Virgil's father was among the sufferers, but Asinius Pollio, who was then legatus in Gallia Transpadana, and the poet Cornelius Gallus, interested themselves in his behalf. At their suggestion, Virgil betook himself to Rome, and obtained from Caesar the restitution of his father's farm. The first eclogue is an expression of gratitude to Caesar for this protection. Deus nobis hec otia fecit. But Virgil and his father were not permitted to remain long in possession of their recovered homestead. The same injustice was repeated a year or two later, and the poet was even in danger of his life. Again he went to Rome, and the influence of Messenus, to whom he had probably become known by the publication of some of his bucolics, secured him not restitution, but compensation, perhaps by a farm in Campania, where he spent much of his later life. Virgil's first work, the bucolics, consisting of ten eclogae, or idols, was composed in the years 41 to 39 B.C., Inspired by Theocritus, they are written in the same meter, and are in great part imitations from his idols. But most of them contain references to contemporary persons and events, especially to the hardships in Transpadane Gaul, from which Virgil himself had suffered so sorely. Caesar, Cornelius Gallus, Alphenus Varus, the successor of Polio as Legatus, and above all Polio himself, have their places in the woods of Titerus. The fourth eclogue, written for the year of Polio's consulship, 40 B.C., treats a theme which hardly belongs to bucolic poetry. Virgil feels that he has to make his woods worthy of a consul. Si canimus silvas, silvae sint consule digne. He salutes the return of the Saturnian kingdoms and the Golden Age. The salutation was premature by ten years, and when peace at length came to the Roman world, Polio, instead of being its inaugurator, was rather an opponent. But it is interesting to observe that the idea of some great change for the better was in the air. The bucolics were written in the north of Italy, not yet Italy at that time. His next work was written in the south, chiefly at Naples. It was Messenus who suggested the subject of the Georgics, a didactic poem in hexameters, dealing with the various parts of a farmer's work. The first book treats of agriculture, the second of the plantation of trees, the third of the care of livestock, the fourth of bees. No subject was more congenial to Virgil's muse, his rustic muse, as he says himself, and from some points of view the Georgics may be regarded as his masterpiece. He has here achieved a task which is the hardest that a poet can undertake, to write true poetry in a didactic form. Rare artistic instinct and genuine love of his subject were happily joined to produce this unique poem, in which Virgil seems to be more truly himself than either in the Bucolics or the Aeneid. The composition and revision of this work occupied the years from 37 to 30 B.C., when it was read aloud to Caesar on his return from Actium. It is interesting to note that the latter part of the fourth book was originally devoted to the praises of the poet's friend Cornelius Gallus, but that after his execution, 27 B.C., this passage was cut out by the wish of the emperor and replaced by the story of Orpheus. In the Georgics, Virgil promises that he will soon gird himself to a greater task and sing the deeds of Caesar. But his poem took the form of an epic in which not Caesar, but Aeneas, the founder of the Julian Gens, was the hero. The work was begun about 29 B.C. and occupied the remaining ten years of the poet's life. He died at Brundusium in 19 B.C., leaving the Aeneid unfinished. 
His wishes were that the great manuscript should be burnt, but Augustus, that such a great work should not perish, committed its publication to Varius and Tuca, friends of Virgil, on the condition that they should make no alterations. Though Augustus was not the hero, there were opportunities, in a poem dealing with the origin of the Latin race and the Alban fathers and the walls of lofty Rome, to look forward over the ages of Roman history and celebrate the glories of him who was to found a golden age. The Aeneid has suffered from the premature death of its creator. It was neither finished nor revised. Yet it would hardly be an injustice to Virgil to say that its excellence and charm lie in particular episodes, in delicate and subtle details of language and rhythm, and not in the poem regarded as a whole. But it must always stand beside the Iliad and Odyssey as the third great epic of antiquity. The Roman dignity and magnitude of the subject, and the wonderful power of the narratives in the second, fourth, and sixth books, have exalted the Aeneid far above the Georgics in the estimation of posterity. Yet it might be argued that Virgil had more in common with Wordsworth than with Milton or with his worshipper Dante. The note of Virgil is natural piety. Perhaps he cannot be better described than by the happy expression which his friend Horace applied to him, anima candida. Virgil was buried close to Naples on the road to Puteoli, and the inscription on his tomb, said to have been dictated by himself before his death, ran thus, Mantua me genuit, calabri rapuere, tenet nunc parthenope, Cetsini pasqua rura tutses. In connection with Virgil, it is natural to mention his elder contemporary and friend, L. Varius Rufus, B.C. 74-14, to celebrated for his epics on Caesar and Octavian, and more celebrated for his tragedy, The Thiestes. Another poet of about the same age was Aemilius Masser of Verona, also a friend of Virgil, and disguised in the bucolics under the name of Mopsus. He wrote poems on natural history, Ornithogonia and Theriaca, but they have been less lucky than his models, the Greek poems of Nicander, which survive to the present day. The unfortunate Cornelius Gallus, 69 B.C. to 27, must also be mentioned here, though his name has its place rather in the age of Catullus and Cinna. It was he who transplanted the erotic elegy of the Alexandrian Greeks to Roman soil, and founded the school of Euphorion, to which Catullus and Cinna belonged. He translated Euphorion into Latin, and wrote four books of original elegies on his own mistress Cytheris, under the name of Lycoris. His death has already been noticed. The great lyric, like the great epic poet, of Rome, was of humble birth. Q. Horatius Flaccus was the son of a freedman, and was born at Venusia, on the borders of Apulia and Lucania, in 65 B.C. After the death of Julius Caesar, 44 B.C., he joined the cause of Brutus, and served under him in Asia and Macedonia, until the Battle of Philippi, 42 B.C. On that occasion he took part in the general flight as he tells us himself, and afterwards returning to Rome, obtained a post as a quasier's secretary. During the next ten years he wrote his satires and epodes, which brought him fame, and secured him the friendship of Virgil and Varius, who introduced him to Messenus. In 37 B.C. we find him accompanying Messenus on the journey to Brindusium, of which he has left us a pleasant description. The intimacy with Messenus ripened, the Epicurean views of life which both held were a bond between the poet and his patron. Horace had a taste for country life, and in 33 B.C. Messenus bestowed upon him a farm in the Sabina territory, which he preferred to royal Rome. Independence was one of the chief characteristics of Horace, and he felt more independent in the country than in the immediate neighborhood of the court. The first book of the satires appeared about 35 B.C., the second book about five years later. In this style of composition the predecessor of Horace was Lucilius, but while Lucilius criticized persons and politics freely, Horace prudently confined himself to generalities on society and literature, owing to the altered circumstances of the time. Lucilius had imitated the Greek writers of old comedy, such as Cretinus and Aristophanes, and Horace stood in somewhat the same relation to his predecessor as the new comedy stood to the old. 
From these talks, sermones, as Horace calls them himself, written like those of Lucilius in hexameter verse and in colloquial style, we learn much about the personality of Horace and about his friends. In the Epodes, which were published about the same time as the second book of the Satires, Horace imitated Archilochus and attacked persons in coarse language. All these poems, except the last, are written in couplets consisting of a longer and a shorter line, generally an iambic trimeter followed by an iambic dimeter. They are the least interesting work of Horace, but they were a good exercise in handling meters and in the imitation of the Greek models, and they led to the odes. The greatest monument of poetry that Horace has bequeathed to posterity is the collection of lyrical poems in our books known as the Odes. The first three books were published in 24 B.C., the fourth eleven years later. In lyric composition he does not claim originality. He only adapted Aeolian song to Italian measures. But he claims priority. He was the first, except Catullus, to make the attempt Princeps Aeolium Carmen at Italus deduxis modus. For this he bids the muse crown him with Delphic laurel. But though the Greek lyric poets, especially Sappho and Alcaeus, were his models, it was an original idea on the part of Horace to turn away from the Alexandrian poets who were then in vogue, and go back to the older singers. It required true genius and wonderful artistic instinct to tune the borrowed lyre to the accents of another tongue. Horace was supremely successful. In the Odes, his poetic judgment is, with few exceptions, faultless. The happiest word comes almost inevitably. His felicity, curiosa felicitas, was praised by Roman critics. Some of these poems are probably free translations from the Greek, but many refer to contemporary people and events. Some deal with Roman history, and the victories won under the auspices of Augustus. The fourth book of the Odes is said to have been published at the instance of the emperor. But in the interval between his earlier and later lyric works, Horace wrote epistles. The first book appeared about 20 B.C. After the strict technical constraints to which he had subjected himself in the Odes, it was a relaxation for the poet to expand himself in the easy and familiar style of the Sermones. But the urbane epistles, though written in the same colloquial language, are very different from the satires. They are more mature, less polemical, and they have a charm of serenity which is wanting in the earlier work. It might be said that if the genius of Virgil found its truest expression in the Georgics, so that of Horace was best expressed in his epistles, and in this form of composition he has never been equaled. The second book of the epistles, written in the later years of his life, includes a treatise on poetry, the Ars Poetica, in the form of a letter to his friends, the Pisos. Horace died in 8 B.C., surviving by a few months his benefactor Mecenes, beside whom he was buried. Though he had at first stood aloof, he became reconciled, as time went on, to the empire, was on good terms with Augustus, and did what was required of him as an Augustan poet. And independent though Horace was, he had a decided weakness for friendships with great people. The influence of Mecenas probably did much to stimulate his poetic activity, for Horace was by no means one of those who cannot help singing. He was not inspired. His poetry is marked by lucidity and judgment. Many poets whose works have not survived, but famous in their own day, are mentioned by Horace. His friend Valgius, who wrote epigrams and elegies, was actually compared to Homer. Aristius Fuscus and Fundanius composed dramas, Pupius doleful tragedies. Here may be mentioned also C. Melissus, who wrote a jest book and originated the Fabula Trabeata, and Domitius Marsus, famous chiefly for his epigrams, in which field he was the predecessor and master of Martial. Of the elegiac poets of this period whose works have come down to us, the most charming is Albius Tibullus, 54 to 19 B.C. Adopting the form of Alexandrian elegy, he breathed into it a fresh spirit of Italian country life. In his love poems to Delia, whose true name was Plania, there is a certain tender melancholy which we do not find in the rest of classical literature. By his deft handling of the pentameter he made an important technical advance in the development of Latin elegy. 
along with his works and under his name were published after his death some poems which were not by him but by a certain ligdamus perhaps a fictitious name also included in the collection of his elegies are some which were written by sulpicia the niece of his patron massala the umbrian poet sextus propertius probably born at assisium about forty nine to fifteen b c did not emancipate himself like Tibullus from the influence of his Alexandrian models, Callimachus and Philetus. On the contrary, he prides himself on his Alexandrianism, and calls himself the Roman Callimachus. He was very learned, and his elegies are full of obscure references to out-of-the-way myths. Nevertheless, no works of the age are so thoroughly impressed with the individuality of the writer as the passionate poems of Propertius. The passion which inspired his song was his love for Hostia, a beautiful and accomplished courtesan, whom he disguised under the name of Cynthia, as Catullus had disguised Clodia under Lesbia, and Tibullus Plania under Delia. His first book of elegies brought him fame, and probably secured him an admission into the circle of Mecenas. The imagination of Propertius was eccentric, his nature melancholic. He looked at things on their gloomy side, and perhaps his special charm is his skilfulness in suggesting vague possibilities of pain or terror. He loved the vague, both in thought and in expression. In his metaphors, the image and the thing imaged often pass into each other, and the meaning becomes indistinct. He seems to have been a man of weak will, and this is reflected in his poetry. It has been noticed by those who have studied his language that he prefers to express feelings as possible rather than real. His thoughts naturally ran in the potential mood. His connection with Cynthia lasted for about five years, and after it was broken off, Propertius wrote little. It was Cynthia who had made him a great poet. The third of the great Roman elegiac poets, P. Ovidius Naso, of equestrian family, was born at Solmo, in the Polygnian territory, 43 B.C. Trained in rhetoric and law, he entered upon an official career, and by the favor of Augustus received the latus clavus, and held some of the lower equestrian posts, such as Vigintiver and Decimver. But he gave his profession up for the sake of poetry. He is said himself, in a verse which probably suggested a familiar line of Pope, that verse-writing came to him by nature. Quid quid tentabum dicere versus erat. He is the only one of the great Augustan poets whose literary career belongs entirely to the Augustan age. His works may be classified in three periods. The extant works of the early period are all on amatory subjects and in elegiac verse. The Amores, in three books, celebrate Corinna. The Ars Amatoria, likewise in three books, give advice to lovers of both sexes as to the conducting of their love affairs, while the Remedia Amoris prescribes cures for a troublesome passion. But the best work of this period is the Heroides, a collection of imaginary letters of legendary heroines such as Penelope, Dido, Phaedra, to their lovers. Here Ovid has shown his poetic power at its best. The two works of the second period, the Metamorphosis and the Fasti, are the most ambitious of Ovid's works. They deal respectively with Greek and Roman mythology. For the Metamorphosis, or Transformations, composed in hexameter verse, Ovid obtained his material chiefly from the Alexandrian poets Nicander and Parthenius. The Fasti, a sort of commentary on the Roman calendar, in elegiac meter, should have consisted of twelve books, one for each month of the year, but only six, March to August, were completed. The third period begins with Ovid's banishment to Tomi in Scythia in 9 A.D., the cause of this banishment is one of those historical mysteries which can never be decided with certainty. The poet himself only ventures on dark hints. He mentions a poem and an error, Carmen et Error, as the two charges which led to his fate. He also said that his eyes were to blame, Cur noxia lumina fetzi? The poem probably refers to his licentious Ars Amatoria, which was so opposed in spirit to the attempts at social reform made by the framer of the Julian laws. But the true cause must have been the mysterious error. It has been conjectured with considerable probability that Ovid had witnessed some act of misconduct on the part of a member of the emperor's family, and was punished for not having prevented it. 
This may have been connected with the adultery of the younger Julia and D. Silanus. The poet, perhaps, was made the scapegoat. In his exile on the shores of the Euxine, he composed the letters Ex Ponto, in four books, and the Tristia, in five books, in which he laments his fate and implores to be forgiven. The Ibis, a bitter attack on some anonymous enemy, on the model of a poem which Callimachus wrote against Apollonius of Rhodes, and an unfinished poem on fishing. Haliotica. He also wrote a Getic poem in honor of Augustus, but neither Augustus nor his successor Tiberius revoked the sentence of the unhappy poet, and Ovid died at Tomi in 17 A.D. In handling the elegiac meter, Ovid bound himself by stricter rules than his predecessors. He had wonderful facility in versification, but he was more of a rhetorician than a poet, and he is most successful where rhetoric tells, as in the Heroides. He lived in ease and luxury, and rejoiced that he lived in the age of Augustus, when life went smoothly. Hexetas moribus apta meis. His love poetry was distinguished by lubricity, and in this he contrasted unfavorably with Tibullus and Propertius. The tragedy of Medea, which he composed in his early period, is not extant, but it and Thyestes of Varius were the two illustrious tragedies of the day two poems, Nux, an elegy, and the Consolatio ad Liviam, were falsely ascribed to Ovid, but were probably written by some contemporary of inferior talent. Among the friends of Ovid, who were likewise poets, may be mentioned Sabinus, who wrote Answers to the Heroides, Ponticus, author of Thebaid, Cornelius Severus, who treated the Sicilian war with Sextus Pompeius in verse, the starry Albinovanus Pedo wrote a Theseid, and also an epic on contemporary history. The Georgics of Virgil and the Haliotics of Ovid belong to the kind of poetry known as didactic. Other works of this class are the Synegetica of Gratius on the art of hunting, and the Astronomica of Manilius in five books. Of the author of this astronomical poem we know nothing, even his name is uncertain but he possessed poetical facility of no mean order and considerable originality. Most of the short occasional pieces, of a light and humorous nature, which were collected under the title of Priapea, belong to the Augustan age, and many of them to the best poets. End of chapter 11, section 1 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 4, 2009Chapter 11, Sections 2 and 3 of J. B. Burry's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 11. Literature of the Augustan Age. Sections 2 and 3 Latin Prose Writers The History of Rome by Titus Livius, 59 B.C. to 17 A.D., stands out as the greatest prose work of the Augustan period. Livy was born at Patavium, and a certain patavinity has been remarked in his diction. But most of his life was spent at Rome, where he studied rhetoric, wrote philosophical dialogues, and enjoyed the friendship of Augustus. He began his history, Ab Urbe Condita Libri was the title, soon after the foundation of the empire, and carried it down as far as the death of Drusus, 9 B.C. The work consisted of 142 books in all, originally distributed in decades, and half-decades, which appeared separately according as they were completed. But only thirty-five books have been preserved to us, namely books one to ten, and books twenty-one to forty-five. We have, however, short epitomes of the contents of almost all the lost books. Livy was a mild and amiable man, who held no extreme views, liked compromise and conciliation, hated violence and turbulence, and could be indulgent to men of all parties. 
This fair and equable temper can be traced in his history. The one thing which is unpardonable in his eyes is harsh fanaticism. Ancient Rome is his ideal, and he regards his own age as degenerate, destitute of the virtues, simplicity, and piety which made the old time so great. His heroes are Cincinnatus, Camillus, Fabius the Delaire. The general view of the course of Roman history he states in strong language in the general preface to his work. He invites his readers to learn by what men and by what policy at home and abroad the empire of Rome was won and increased, then to follow the gradual decline of discipline and morals, then witness that decline becoming more and more marked, and ending in a headlong downward rush, until his own times are reached, in which we cannot endure our vices nor submit to remedies. We cannot doubt his honesty as a historian, but his views of writing history were such that his statements must often be received with caution. For though he wished to tell the truth, he cared much more for style than for facts. He had little idea of historical method or of historical research. He gave himself no trouble to ascertain the truth in doubtful cases. For the early history he simply worked up into an artistic form the narratives of Polybius and of late Roman analysts, especially Valerius of Antium, and did not exert himself to consult all the available sources, or even the best. His knowledge of constitutional matters was unsound, nor was he at home in military history. He approached his subject rather as a rhetorician than as a historian, and as a literary work his history takes rank among the great histories of the world. His style was prolix. Ancient critics observed that he used more words than were necessary, and his abundance, lactea ubertas, was contrasted with the conciseness of Sallust. Pompeius Trogus wrote a universal history in forty-four books, beginning with the Assyrian Ninus, and ending with his own time. It was entitled Historiae Philippicae. The original work has not come down to us, but in a later age it was abbreviated by a certain Justinus, and this abridgment is extant. Other historians of the Augustan period were L. Aruntius, who wrote an account of the Punic War in the style of Sallust, and Fenestella, an antiquarian, who, in his Annales, paid special attention to social and constitutional history. C. Julius Hyginus, a freedman of Augustus and a librarian of the Palatine Library, was an interesting figure in the literary history of his time. He may be regarded as the successor of Varro, as an antiquarian and polymath. He wrote on the cities of Italy, De situ urbium italicarum, on illustrious Romans, De viris claris, on agriculture, also a commentary on Virgil. All these books are lost, but a mythological fabulae and an astronomical work have come down under his name, and perhaps are really his. Of other antiquarians, many of whose names we know, must be mentioned M. Varius Flaccus, who wrote a book on the calendar, Fasti, and an important lexicographical work entitled De Verborum Significatu. Most valuable, as the only work of the kind that has been preserved, is the treatise of Vitruvius Polio, De Architectura, in ten books, it was dedicated to Augustus and finished before 13 B.C. Of the many philosophers, rhetors, and orators who talked and wrote at this period, there is none of any interest to posterity. Among philosophical writers may be mentioned Q. Sextius Niger, and his son of the same name. Among the rhetors, M. Porcius Latro, of whose declamations some extracts are preserved, and among orators, the fluent Haterius, the rabid Lebienus, the biting Cassius Severus. The two great jurists of the Augustan age were M. Antistius Labeo, 59 B.C. to 12 A.D., and his younger rival, C. Ateus Capito, 34 B.C. to 22 A.D., who founded schools afterwards, known as the Proculian and Sabinian, respectively. Section 3. Greek Literature From the year 146 B.C. forward, Greek literature begins to hold a place in Roman history along with the advance of Roman sway over the Greek world. By the time of Augustus, nearly all the Greeks of Europe, Asia, and Egypt have become either immediate or federate subjects of Rome. Their literature, therefore, on this grounds, claims the attention of the student of Roman history. 
but still more because many Greek writers busied themselves with the history and antiquities of their new mistress. Polybius is the first and most famous example of a Greek writing Roman history, but under the empire Greek books on Roman subjects are numerous. Dionysus of Halicarnassus came to Rome soon after the Battle of Actium, and lived there for more than twenty years, studying Latin literature and writing in his own language on Latin subjects. While he was at Rome he associated with men of the senatorial class, and his writings are animated with republican sentiments. He continued the work of Polybius in endeavoring to reconcile his countrymen to Roman sway. Polybius had expounded the role which Rome was destined to play in history. Dionysius is concerned to show that she was worthy to play it. In his work on Roman archaeology, which he finished in 8 B.C., he seems to prove, by tracing out mythical connection between Rome and Greece, that the Romans were not really barbarians. It was a mark of gratitude for the kind treatment which he experienced at Rome. This work consisted of twenty books, but only the first eleven are preserved entire. The style is wordy and rhetorical, very unlike that of Polybius. He used good sources, but he has no appreciation of the meaning or methods of history. He even puts long rhetorical speeches into the mouths of legendary persons. He defines history as philosophy by examples. In questions of literary criticism, however, he is quite at home, and his various literary treatises, in which he shows thorough appreciation of the old masters, are of considerable value. More interesting in some ways than the literary treatise of Dionysius is that of a certain Longinus, of whom personally nothing is known. On the sublime, or more correctly, on loftiness of style, which seems to have been written in the early years of the first century A.D. It contains much enlightened and suggestive criticism. The author had some acquaintance with the Hebrew scriptures. Nicolaus of Damascus, born about 64 B.C., was a great friend of King Herod, whom he assisted in his work of Hellenism. He had been the teacher of the children of Antony and Cleopatra. He was a very prolific author, and wrote on philosophical, rhetorical, and historical subjects. His greatest work was a universal history, planned on a very large scale, which Herod stimulated him to compose. Of it we have only fragments, but his panegyrical life of Caesar, Augustus, a declamatory rather than historical work, has come down to us complete. The long Geographica of Strabo, 63 B.C. to 23 A.D., in seventeen books, is of great historical importance as giving a picture of some of the subject lands of Rome in the Augustan age. Strabo was of a good Cappadocian family, a native of Amazea, and lived at Alexandria. He came to Rome about the same time as Dionysius, but soon left it. He describes the whole known world, but in many cases his information was mainly derived from older books, and cannot be taken as representing the condition of things which prevailed in his own time. Books one and two deal with physical geography. Books three to ten describe Europe. Books eleven to sixteen, Asia. Book seventeen, Africa. His accounts of Asia Minor and Egypt are especially valuable, as he knew these lands himself, and mentions many of his own experiences. His description of Spain is also valuable, for though he had not been there, he had evidently received recent information about it, probably at Rome. From Strabo's work we get a very distinct impression of the blessings of the Pax Augusta, and the safety which travellers now enjoyed both by sea and land. He also wrote a work entitled Historical Memoirs, in over forty books, but it has not been preserved. End of chapter 11 Section 3 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 4, 20091 to 2 of J. B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie von Mulligan. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1 by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 12 The Principate of Tiberius. Sections 1 to 2. Section 1. Accession of Tiberius It was generally regarded as a matter of course that Tiberius should step into the place of Augustus. The Roman world did not dream of a revolution. 
and it was felt that the monarchy naturally fell to him, who stood in the same relation to the now divine Augustus as Augustus himself to the divine Julius. Men universally acquired, in the succession of Tiberius as the heir, the adopted son, the chosen cohort of the deceased emperor. But though such feelings moved men's minds, constitutionally, the empire was elective, not hereditary, and the senate and the people could, without infringing the constitution, have conferred the principate on someone wholly unconnected with the Julian family. Augustus had himself named three nobles who might possibly compete with Tiberius. Lepidus, who was equal to the position but despised it, Asinius Gallus, who might desire it but was unequal to it, and Arentius, who was not unworthy of it and would dare to seek it if a chance were offered. But even from Arentius, Tiberius had nothing to fear. The only possible rival seemed to be his own kinsman, his nephew Germanicus, who was absent in Gaul, and Agrippa Posthumus, who was still pined in the island to which his grandfather had banished him. The unlucky Agrippa was slain by his gauler immediately after the death of Augustus, and there can be no doubt that the order for his execution was given either by Tiberius or by Livia. When the death of Augustus was announced, Tiberius, by virtue of the tribunitian power which he had received in the preceding year for an indefinite period, convoked the Senate. He had already given the watchword to the Praetorian cohorts, and sent dispatches to the legions as if he were formerly emperor. It is not quite clear whether this was formally an act of usurpation, for it might have been held that the proconsular imperium, which Tiberius possessed before the death of Augustus, having been bestowed by a decree of the Senate, and not being merely derived from the imperium of the princeps, did not cease on the death of the princeps. In any case, the act seemed an anticipation of his election to the principate, and Tiberius afterwards made a sort of apology for it to the Senate. But senate and people, consuls and prefects, took an oath of obedience to him without a sign of hesitation. The proconsular imperium was renewed or confirmed, and the various rights which had been granted to Augustus by separate enactments were conferred upon him, doubtless by single comprehensive law, lex de imperio. Tiberius, indeed, adopting the maxims of statecraft which he had learned from his predecessor, feigned reluctance to assume the immense task of directing such a vast empire, and suggested that the functions of government should be divided among more than one ruler. But it was easily seen that the suggestion was not intended seriously. It was part of the transparent comedy which was played henceforward between the senate and the princeps. It is important to observe that a practice adopted by Augustus of assuming the empire for a defined period of years was now abundant. On the other hand, Tiberius would not assume it for life. No term was fixed, but he intimated his intention of resigning the principate when the state no longer needed him. Here again no one took his words, as seriously meant. The first care of Tiberius was the funeral and deification of Augustus. The dead body was borne by senators to the Campus Martius, where it was burned and the ashes were bestowed in the imperial mausoleum. Funeral orations were pronounced both by Tiberius and by his son Drusus. The senate decreed temples and priests to the Divus Augustus, who was thus raised to place beside his father, the Divus Julius. His will, which had been deposited in the charge of the Vestal Virgins, was read before the Senate and thus published abroad. It bequeathed two-thirds of his fortune to Tiberius, and the remainder to Livia, who was to be adopted into the Julian family and bear the name Augusta. If these heirs failed, one-third of the property was to descend to Drusus, the son of Tiberius, and the remainder to Germanicus and his three sons. But these legacies were considerably diminished 
by the large donations which were left to the citizens and to the praetorian and legionary soldiers along with his fortune the old emperor bequeathed in his privarium imperii some councils of government he deprecated the admission of provincials to the privileged position of roman citizens he condemned the further extension of the frontiers of roman dominion and he advised that as many men of ability as possible should be engaged in the administration of public affairs it seems probable that the second of these councils specially regarded the conquest of transrhenan in germany and we shall see how tiberius acted on it section two germanicus on the rhine the first weeks of the reign of tiberius were disturbed by mutinies in the rhine and danube armies discontent had long been smouldering and had only been hindered from bursting forth by respect for the old emperor the soldiers who defended the german frontiers contrasted the hardships which they were obliged to endure in harsh climates and remote regions the small pay which they received the unduly long term of service and the inadequate provision awaiting them at its expiration with the easy life and the higher pay of the praetorian guards who could look forward to gifts of land in italy itself on the news of the death of augustus mutinies broke out simultaneously on the danube and on the rhine the pannonian army consisting of three legions under the command of julius blasius threw off the authority of their general and demanded that the term of service should be reduced from twenty to sixteen years and that the veterans should receive their pensions in money blasius was forced to send his son to rome to bear these demands to the new emperor and in the meantime the troops vented their pent-up wrath on the centurions whom they most detested and refused to perform their military duties tiberius dispatched some praetorian cohorts under his son drusus to treat with the mutineers and restore order but sent no definite message of concession the soldiers were enraged when they discovered that drusus was instructed to evade rather than comply with their demands and the young prince was with difficulty rescued from their fury but an eclipse of the moon opportunely took place the superstitious soldiers were alarmed and seized with a fit of remorse they listened to the indefinite promises of drusus and returned to their allegiance the ringleaders were given up and put to death the revolt of the rhine legions was a more serious danger in pannonia there was no question of setting up a rival emperor but this danger existed on the rhine germanicus caesar governor of gaul and general of the eight legions stationed on the german frontier was marked out as the successor of tiberius his adoptive father and the troops of lower germany conceived the design of hastening his reign they not only demanded shorter service higher pay and lighter labour but proclaimed their intention of carrying germanicus to rome and making him emperor germanicus was at the time absent in lugodunum occupied with the census of gaul aulus sicina an experienced officer was in command of the legions of the lower province while upper germany had been assigned to see silius when the news reached germanicus he hastened to his camp on the lower rhine which lay in the land of the ubi and appeared in the presence of the mutineers an exciting scene then took place the soldiers beseeching their popular commander to right their wrongs showing him the marks of their wounds and stripes finally urging him to march to rome and seize the sovereign power germanicus expostulating and praising the virtues of tiberius the excitement reached such a pitch that it was necessary to withdraw the general from the presence of the troops it was a critical moment the mutineers talked of destroying the town of the Ubi, Obidum Obiorum, and plundering the cities of Gaul. The German foes beyond the Rhine would not fail to take advantage speedily of the broken discipline of the army. To restore order, Germanicus was forced to concede, in the name of Tiberius, 
the demands of the troops. He promised that the terms of service should be shortened, and that large donatives should be distributed. The legions then returned to their winter quarters, two under Germanicus to Opidum Ubiorum, the other two under the legatus Aulus Secina to Castra Vetra. But at this moment messengers arrived from Rome, for the purpose of investigating the causes of the discontent, and when the soldiers saw that concessions might fail to be ratified, the mutiny broke out more furiously than ever. Germanicus decided that his wife and children should leave the camp. It does not appear that he apprehended any serious danger on their account, for no measures were taken to conceal their flight. They departed in broad daylight, and in view of the whole camp. The side of Agrippina carrying in her arms the little boy Gaius, who had been born and reared in the camp, and whom they had nicknamed Caligula Boots, from the Caligulae or military boots which they made him wear in sport, moved their hearts to remorse. The memory of her father Agrippa, her grandfather Augustus, her father-in-law Drusus, stirred their pride and when they learned that her destination was the city of the Treveri, jealousy prompted them to make peace with their general. Germanicus ceased on the propitious moment to work on their softened feelings, and recalled him to their duty. They fell on their knees before him, begged for forgiveness, and zealously delivered their ringleaders to punishment. It seems likely that this scene was expressly devised by Germanicus, as a last resource for appealing to the nobler sentiments of the insurgents. Thus was the danger averted in the Ubian camp. In Castra Vetra, the skilful management of the experienced Seikina restored discipline, while at Mugontiacum, the agitators who tried to stir to rebellion the army of the upper province seemed to have totally failed. The only peril which threatened the succession of Tiberius was thus hindered, and for this he had to thank the unshaken fidelity of his nephew. Germanicus had refused to listen when the troops tempted him to disloyalty. He declined to take the flood of the tide, which might have led him to fortune. If he had marched to Rome at the head of the Germanic legions, he would have plunged the state once more in civil war but it is not certain that he would have been the survivor. Germanicus was a man of considerable ability, and his affable manners and urbanity won him friends everywhere. In the camp he associated freely with the soldiers, and they idolized him. He had his father's gift of making himself popular, but he had not his father's genius. It was his dream, however, to restore the work which Drusus had so brilliantly begun, and carry the eagles of Rome once more to the Albis. Immediately after the suppression of the mutiny, the young Caesar decided to employ the discontented legions, who were themselves anxious for active service. Hostilities against the Germans had been slumbering for the past few years, but no treaty had been made since the defeat of Varus, so that in making a sudden incursion, the Romans were formally justified. It had been questioned why Sir Germanicus was not exceeding his powers in taking the offence without the express permission of the emperor. But as he had been entrusted by Augustus with his large command for the purpose of conducting the war and defending the frontier against the Germans, it must clearly have been left to his discretion when he might advance and when he should retire. In the late autumn, 14 A.D., the legions and cohorts of the lower province crossed the Rhine, cut their way through the Silver Caesar, and through the rampart which Tiberius had constructed after the Varian disaster as the limes of Roman territory. Thus they reached the land of Damasi, who dwelt between the rivers which are now called Lippi and Ruhr. Zekina advanced in front with some light cohorts to reconnoitre and clear the way. It was discovered that the Marsi were to spend the night in solemn festivities, and when the Romans approached their villages after sunset, the inhabitants, unsuspicious and inebriated, 
offered an easy prey. The legions were divided into four wedges cunei, which devastated the country for fifty miles with fire and sword, sparing neither sex nor rage. The holy places of the Marsi, especially the sacred precinct of the deity Tamphana, were levelled with the ground. The fate of the Marsi roused to arms neighbouring tribes, the Bructeri, who lived northward, the Tubantes, who dwelt on the Rora, Rur, and the Eusipetes, between the Lopia and the Manus. They stationed themselves in the woods through which the Romans had to return, but the zeal of the legions and the skill of the commander shook off the enemy, and the winter quarters were safely reached. The revolt on the lower Rhine had caused serious anxiety at Rome, and especially to Tiberius, coming as it did in conjunction with the mutiny in Pannonia. The Pannonic army was nearer Italy. On the other hand, the Germanic army was far larger, and the emperor, uncertain in which of the camps his presence was more needful, and afraid of giving the preference to either, ended by remaining in Rome and watching the issue of events. The news that Germanicus had quelled the mutiny was a great relief, but it was suspected that the military success which he gained in his brief campaign was not so agreeable to Tiberius. If so, the emperor dissembled his jealousy, praised the achievement of his nephew in the presence of the senate, and granted him the honour of a triumph. The following year was marked by two distinct invasions of Germany, which, however, hung closely together, and were parts of a common design. Of all the German tribes, the Cherusci, the tribe of Arminius, was the most formidable and the most hostile. They had been the leaders in the fight for freedom, which ended in the Varian disaster. Against them, above all others, policy and revenge excited the spirit of Germanicus. His plan was to prevent his neighbouring peoples from assisting them, and then attack them alone. Their most powerful neighbours were the Keti, and the first expedition was directed against them. 1. In the spring the four legions of the Lower Rhine crossed the river from Castra Vetra, under the command of Seikina, who was to prevent the tribes in that quarter, especially the Marsi and the Karaski, from marching to aid the Keti. Zekina's army was augmented by bands of the cis renowned German tribes, Batavians, Ubi, Sugambri. Meanwhile, Germanicus himself, at the head of the four legions of the Upper Rhine, advanced into the territory of Mount Taunus, and attacked the Catti so suddenly that no serious resistance could be made. Their fortress Matium was destroyed. By this means, the Cadi were prevented from making common cause with the Karaski. That people was distracted at this time by domestic discords. The Gestes was invoking the help of the Romans against his enemy and son-in-law Arminius, the hero of the Teutoburg forest. The messengers of the Gestes reached Germanicus as he was returning to his Rhine, and besought him to relieve their master, who was blockaded by his enemies. The Roman army retraced their steps, entered the borders of the Kiruski, and delivered Therali, who was able in return to restore some of the spoils of Pharis, and hand over some important hostages, among Caesar's daughter Ciselda, the wife of Arminius. That warrior, infuriated at the capture of his wife, left nothing undone to stir up the passions of his nation, and he succeeded in winning over in Guoma an influential noble who had hitherto sided with the Romans. 2. Germanicus and Sekina, who had signally defeated the Marsi, having returned to the Rhine, prepared for a grand expedition against the enemy, conceived on the same plan which Drusus had formerly adopted with success. The army was divided in three parts. Sekina led his legions through the land of the Bructory, to the banks of the upper Armisia. Germanicus and the four legions of the upper province embark to coast along the shore of the North Sea, and enter the river at its mouth, while the cavalry under Peter Albinovinus, the poet, march to the same goal through the land of the Frisii. Successfully united, 
the combined army laid waste far and wide the land between the Armisia and the Lepia. Here they were near the Celtus Temptobergiensis, where the remains of Varus and his legions lay unburied, and Germanicus could not resist the desire of visiting the spot, erecting a mound over the white bones, and honouring with funeral rites the slaughtered Romans. The lonely and melancholy scene produced a deep impression on the legions, but they were soon required to extricate themselves from a trip similar to that which had ensnared the Varian army. Arminius had hidden his forces in the forest, and the Romans had not secured themselves sufficiently against surprise. But Germanicus and Sacina were more skilful than Varus, and though he did not defeat the enemy, he retreated to Amidia with some difficulty. The return to his Rhine was not easy. The cavalry of Pedo reached their quarters without mischance. But the country through which the way of Sikina lay was heavy and marshy, and the Germans of Arminius and Inguima sought to surround him as they had surrounded Ferris. The experienced Sikina was cool and collected in these perils, and knew how to maintain discipline, but he might have failed to extricate his army but for a false move of the foe. The Germans had made a successful attack on the cavalry and baggage of the Romans, and, elated by their luck, proceeded, contrary to the counsels of Arminius, to assault the Roman camp. Waiting until they had reached the rampart, Sikina suddenly threw open the gates, and poured out his troops on the besiegers. The Germans suffered a decisive defeat, Inguima was severely wounded, and the Romans were able to proceed on their way. A false rumour of their destruction had gone before them to Castrovetra, and it was proposed to there to break down the Rhine Bridge, but the humanity and courage of Agrippina saved the means of retreat for the fugitive army. She stood at the head of the bridge, and would not move until the remnant should reach it, and she was repaid by seeing the arrival of the four legions, safe and whole. The return of Germanicus himself was attended with ill luck and serious losses. He found it necessary to light in his ships amid the shallow waters of the Phrygian coast, and disembarked two legions, directing them to march along the shore. The treacherous equinoctial tides swept away a large number of the soldiers and much of their baggage. On the whole, the campaign could hardly be regarded as a success. The dangers and losses of the return march threw a cloud over the expedition, and Tiberius had some reason to murmur at the little results obtained at such expense. The advantages won by Germanicus were only momentary, for he had done nothing to effect a permanent occupation of the country which he had laid waste. He had built no fort, and established no lines of communication. His wisdom in visiting the battlefield of Varus was open to question. Tiberius, naturally distrustful, nourished some jealousy and perhaps fear of his popular nephew, and there were enemies of Germanicus at Rome who were eager to encourage such feelings. But the emperor had not yet decided to interfere with the plans of Germanicus for the subjugation of Germany, and he professed to regard the achievements of the year as worthy of a triumph. He seems not to have fully made up his mind yet, whether the conquest of Germany was really desirable, or its permanent occupation possible. The next and last campaign of Germanicus, 16 AD, was planned on a larger scale. This time he hoped to reach the Albis, and break the last resistance of the Karaski. A fleet of one thousand ships was collected, where the Rhine broadens and branches into the Verhalis, and the whole army embarked and sailed down the Fossa Drusiana, where Germanicus invoked the spirit and recalled the memory of his father. Before starting, he had taken the precaution to send his legatus, C. Silius, to make a demonstration against the Catti, and had himself, with six legions, marched up the valley of Lupia, to secure strongholds and make provisions for the return of his army. The fleet reached the mouth of Amidia safely, and, leaving the ships anchored and guarded, 
the Romans advanced in a southeastern direction to the banks of the Visurgis, where the Germans, prepared for their coming, had concentrated their forces under the leadership of the indefatigable Arminius. Here, at length, the Roman invader and the champion of German freedom were to fairly try their strength in a field of battle. The reserved historian Tacitus rises to the occasion as he describes the campaign which decided both the destinies of Germany and the fortunes of his hero Germanicus. He embellishes his Germaniad with tales which have a ring of legend and throw over the young general a halo of romance which his deeds hardly deserved. The colloquy of Arminius and his renegade brother Flavius, standing on the opposite banks of the Visurgis, is, if not true, well imagined. Flavius had lost an eye in the service of the Romans, and Arminius, when he had inquired and learned the cause of the disfigurement, asked, What was thy reward? I received, said Flavius, increase of pay, a gold chain and crown, and other military distinctions. Vile badges of slavery, sneered his brother. Flavius continued to praise the greatness of Rome and the emperor, while Arminius appealed to ancestral freedom and the national gods of Germany. At length such bitter words were bandied, and the wrath of the brothers rose so high that they were about to plunge into the stream and grip each other in mortal struggle. But the Romans intervened and dragged Flavius from the bank. The night adventure of Germanicus has the same epic flavour as the converse of the German brethren. The Romans crossed the Visurgis in the face of the enemy, who had retreated into the recesses of a sacred wood, and news was brought that Arminius contemplated a night attack on the Roman camp. Tacitus tells us how Germanicus, like our own Henry V, was seized with the desire to ascertain the spirit of his soldiers, and how for this purpose he disguised himself, and with his skin over his shoulders, attended by one companion, he went round to camp and listened to near the tents. He was pleased to hear his own praises loudly sung, and to observe that the men were eager to punish the perfidious foe. As he traversed the camp, a German horseman rode up to the rampart, and in the Latin tongue invited deserters in the name of Arminius, with promises of lands, wives, and a daily sum of money. Scornful was the answer, let the day break, let battle begin, we will ourselves seize your wives and lands. The battle was fought in the plain of Edistaviso, which probably lies to the south of the Porta Westphalica on the right bank of the Visurgis. The Germans had occupied the lower slopes of the mountains, and were protected in the rear by wood, unencumbered with brushwood, and thus offering an easy retreat. The Karaski placed themselves on the higher hills, intending to rush down upon the Romans in the midst of the battle. While the legions and auxiliaries advanced to attack the German position in the open plain, Germanicus sent a body of cavalry round to outflank the enemy and fall on their rear. This movement was completely successful. The German forces, which were stationed in the wood, were driven out of their cover into the plain, while at the same time the ranks which were drawn up in the plain were beaten back before the onset of the legions into the wood. The confusion was increased by the Karaski, who were forced by the attack of the cavalry to descend from the hills into the midst of the battle. Arminius essayed bravely to sustain the fight, but he and his fellows were surrounded by the Roman forces, and their doom seemed sealed. Arminius, however, and Ingurma managed to escape, perhaps owing to the treachery of some German auxiliaries. The rest were slain. This decisive victory was gained by the Romans without any serious loss. The soldiers saluted Tiberius as Imperator, and erected the trophy of the arms of the enemy, subscribing the names of the conquered nations. The defeated and dejected Germans were, it is said, preparing to cross the Albus and leave their country to the victor, but this trophy excited their rage and decided them to make another desperate attempt. It may be suspected, however, that the battle of Idisaviso 
was less decisive than it has been represented. In any case, the enemy once more collected large forces, and occupied a place protected by woods and a deep swamp, and on one side by an old rampart. But Germanicus discovered their position, and did not fall into the trap. He attacked them on the side of the earthwork, and forced his way into the small space in which they were thickly packed together. Their position was desperate. If they retreated, and they must perish in the march, and with a long sword they could sustain no equal combat with the legions at such close quarters. Germanicus, it is said, was in the thickest of the fray, crying that the Germans must be exterminated. But the barbarians fought it well. Armenius escaped, and the cavalry engagement was indecisive. At nightfall the Romans returned to their camp, victorious indeed, but without having exterminated or routed the foe. The angry Varii were the only tribe who sued for peace. Germanicus erected a second trophy, which it told how the army of Tiberius Caesar, having subdued all the nations between the Rhine and the Albus, dedicated this monument to Mars, and Jupiter, and Augustus. It was now the middle of summer, and Germanicus, notwithstanding his successes, resolved to retrace his steps. Some of the legions returned by land, others by sea on the ships which awaited them at the mouth of the Amisia. The voyage was disastrous, owing to the violent gales which agitate the North Sea in the autumn season. The fleet was scattered, and Germanicus himself wrecked on the shore of the Corsi. The losses, however, were not so great as was at first thought, and on his return to the Rhine, some successes gained against Damasia and the Catti partly restored the spirit of the troops, which the sea disaster had damped, and the last of the captured eagles of Varus were recovered. Germanicus deemed that it was now near the goal of his ambition. One more campaign would suffice, he thought, for the complete subjugation of Germany. But destiny decreed, and Tiberius judged otherwise. It is clear enough that the victories of the last campaign were far less important and complete than Tacitus has tried to make them out. Their results were only temporary, and the emperor, perhaps wisely, decided that no abiding result was likely to be achieved by Germanicus. There was indeed reason for disappointment. Nothing had been accomplished in proportion to the magnitude of the expeditions. Accordingly, Tiberius offered the consulship to his nephew, and this was equivalent to a recall. How far the sovereign was influenced by a lurking jealousy of the popular general, how far he deemed it inexpedient, that a close connection between Germanicus and the Rhine army should continue, we cannot say. But it is only fair to point out that the recall of Germanicus can be completely explained by political considerations without taking into account any personal motives. Tiberius may have come to the conclusion that annual invasions of Germany were too slow and costly a method of winning the new province, even though it were certain that this method must ultimately succeed. A different policy was suggested by the intestine feuds of the barbarians. If the Romans retired from the field, a deadly contest must soon take place between the Saxon and the Swavian tribes, and when the enemy had enfeebled themselves in domestic war, the Romans might step in and take possession of their country. This was a plausible policy, and was perhaps seriously entertained by Tiberius. But it is possible that he had really come to regard the advance to the Albus as a visionary idea which it would not be expedient to realize. If the Rhine troops changed their station to the banks of the Albus, would not another army be required to watch Gaul, and would the state be able to support another army? These were the questions which a statesman had to consider, and they may have decided Tiberius as they seemed to have decided Augustus, that the Rhine was roughly the limit. In any case, financial considerations had probably much to do with the disappointment of the dreams of Germanicus. From the year 17 AD forward, we never find one man uniting under his single authority both the government of the Gallic provinces and the command of the Germanic armies. Henceforward, 
the three provinces of Gaul are administered by three Praetorian governors, and the two frontier districts, Upper and Lower Germany, are kept strictly separate under two consular legati, who are always, up to the time of Hadrian, strictly military commanders, legati exercitus inferioris et superioris, not legati provinciae, though often loosely spoken of as such. The financial administration of these military districts was at first combined with that of Belgica, like that of Numidia with Africa. It is to be observed that for many years yet the province of Lower Germany extended beyond the Rhine and as far as the Lower Amisia. The young general celebrated a brilliant triumph, 26 of May, 17 A.D., over the conquered nations between the Rhine and Albus. The Snelta, the wife of Arminius, with her infant son Simelicus, whom she had borne in captivity, was among the captives who adorned the procession. It is said that in the midst of the festivities people felt a gloomy presentiment, comparing the young Caesar with his father Drusus and his uncle Marcellus, who, like him, had been so popular, but had died so early. Brave and unlucky, they said, have been the loves of the Roman people. After his triumph, Germanicus was appointed to an honourable mission in the East. At the same time, his cousin Drusus was sent to Illyricum to observe the course of affairs in northern Europe. Arminius and his Kiroski, with their Saxon federates, having no longer to oppose the invasions of the Romans, hastened to deal with the Swaven state in the south, over which Maribodius held sway with the title of king. It will be remembered that this chief had refused to join Arminius after the defeat of Varus. He was an admirer of Roman civilization, having spent part of his youth in Rome, and he tried to introduce Roman manners and government among his countrymen. Throughout the struggle for freedom he had remained persistently neutral. The centre of his power and his palace lay in Boyohemen, but he was recognised as the head of a large and loose wavy confederacy. Of these tribes, the Semnones and Langobardi deserted his cause on the first attack of the Karaski. On the other hand, the Karaskan and Guiomir went over to Maribodius. A decisive battle was fought, in which the Swavians were defeated, and many more of his allies deserted the Swavi king, who then applied for aid to the Roman emperor. Tiberius immediately sent Drusus to confirm peace, perhaps really to effect the downfall of Maribodius. The unlucky king was finally overthrown and driven from his realm by Catuelda, chief of the Catones, a people who lived on the lower Vistula. They invaded the land of the Marcomanni, and stormed the town and stronghold of Maribodius, who was forced to flee to the refuge of the empire and throw himself on the emperor's mercy. Ravenna was assigned to him as a dwelling-place, where Tilsnelda and her son had been also doomed to live. It was a curious historical coincidence that the city of the marshes, which was destined five centuries later to be the capital of the great German hero, the Ostrogothic King Theodoric, should have been selected as the habitation of Maribodius, his predecessor, in attempting to spread Roman ideas among his countrymen. Maribodius lived eighteen years at Ravenna, vainly expecting to be restored to power. He had the satisfaction to see Catuelda overthrown, and like himself seeking a refuge from the Romans. He had the satisfaction to see his younger rival Arminius succumb to the guile of a domestic enemy, 21 A.D. After the defeat of the Swavians, the hero of Germany had been false himself to the freedom for which he had fought, and tried to establish a monarchical power. He was undoubtedly, says the Roman historian, the deliverer of Germany, and not one of those who attacked the Roman people at the beginning of its power, but when it was at the height of its prosperity. He lost battles, but in war he was unconquered. He died at the age of thirty-seven, in the twelfth year of his power, and he is still sung among the barbarians, although to the annals of the Greeks he is unknown, and among the Romans not as celebrated as he deserves. 
End of chapter 12, section 1 to 2. Twelve sections three and four of J. B. Bury's *The Student's Roman Empire*, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. *The Student's Roman Empire*, Part One, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter Twelve, Section Three to Four. Section 3. Germanicus in the East. His Death and the Trial of Piso. In the East several affairs demanded the attention of the government, but not so imperatively as to require an extraordinary command like that which Tiberius assigned to Germanicus after his triumph. The dependent principalities of Cappadocia, Comagene, and Cilicia Aspera had to be transformed into provinces, for Archelaus of Cappadocia had been recalled to Rome, and informed that he had ceased to reign, while the peoples of Comagene and Cilicia had, on the death of their princes, begged for a direct Roman government. The inhabitants of Judea and Syria were murmuring loudly at the heavy taxation, and demanding a reduction. New difficulties had also arisen with the Parthian kingdom. Vonones, the son of Phrates IV, who had been kept by Augustus as a hostage and brought up at Rome, was elected to the throne by the Parthians after the death of their king. He did not, however, reign long. His Roman manners gave offence, and he was forced to surrender his throne to Artabanus of Media, and fly to Seleucia. The Armenian throne was at this moment vacant, and the people accepted the fugitive Vonones as their sovereign. But Artabanus, who could not endure the rule of his rival in a neighbouring kingdom, called upon them to surrender him. Meanwhile, Silanus, legatus of Syria, got possession of the person of Vonones, and detained him in Syria. All these affairs might have been arranged by ordinary imperial legati, but Tiberius may have had a good reason for sending a near kinsman and a Caesar, invested with special powers and representing the imperial majesty, to deal with the eastern countries, where pomp always produces its effect. Such a plan had been successful before, when Gaius Caesar received a like mission from Augustus. The sphere of the command of Germanicus was all the provinces beyond the Hellespont. He travelled thither at leisurely speed, visiting Nicopolis, Athens, and Lesbos on his way, and lingering in the cities of the Hellespont. The affairs of Armenia he arranged without difficulty, and established friendly relations with the Parthian king. The favour of the Armenians inclined to Zeno, son of Polemo, former king of Pontus, who had been brought up as an Armenian from his infancy, and was popular by his excellence as a huntsman and a trencherman. Germanicus visited the city of Artaxia and solemnly crowned Zeno there under the royal name of Artaxes. This arrangement also satisfied Artabanus, who regarded Venones as the Roman candidate, and had put forward his own son, Orodes, as the Parthian candidate. The election of Artaxes was a satisfactory compromise, and Artabanus sent a courteous message to the Roman general, proposing a personal meeting on the Euphrates, and only requiring him to remove Venones from Syria so as to prevent communications with the disaffected party in Persia. Germanicus readily acceded to the request, and Venones was removed to Pompeiopolis in Cilicia. Thus, excellent relations were established between the Roman and the Parthian powers, and continued to exist during the lifetime of Artaxes, until the last years of the reign of Tiberius. Cappadocia and Comagene were at the same time incorporated in the provincial system, and thus the direct rule of Rome extended now to the Euphrates. Germanicus had speedily and satisfactorily accomplished the main object of his mission, but he had other difficulties to contend with. It was not the intention of Tiberius that the ample authority of the young Caesar should be as completely unchecked in the east as it had been in the north. Consequently, Silanus, who was a personal friend of Germanicus, was replaced as proconsul of Syria by C. Calpurnius Piso, a proud, self-asserting nobleman, who would not hesitate to hold his own against his superior. The position of Pisa was strengthened, and his independent spirit, encouraged by the bonds of intimacy which existed between his wife Plancina and the emperor's mother Livia. The dissensions of Piso and Germanicus were doubtless embittered by the rivalry of Plancina and Agrippina. 
Piso had been instructed to lead or send a portion of the Syrian army to join Germanicus in Armenia. He disobeyed this command, and the ill feeling between the Caesar and the legatus became very bitter. It is not clear why Germanicus did not invoke the intervention of the emperor, but instead of asserting his authority in Syria, he made an excursion to Egypt, not for any political purpose, but from a curiosity to visit the antiquities of the land. This expedition was imprudent in two ways, for it left the field clear to Piso, and it violated the law of Augustus, that no senator should set foot on Egyptian soil without the express permission of the emperor. On returning to Syria, Germanicus found that Piso had disregarded and overthrown his own regulations. This discovery roused him into asserting his authority, and Piso prepared to leave the province. Suddenly, Germanicus fell ill at Antioch, and Piso postponed his departure. The attendants of Germanicus suspected and circulated their suspicions that poison had been administered to him by Piso or his wife. Messages inquiring after the health of the prince arrived from Piso, who was lingering at Seleucia. But Germanicus, distrustful of their genuineness, wrote a letter to the governor, renouncing his friendship and commanding him, perhaps, to leave the province. Piso sailed to Cos, and there received the news of his rival's death, 19 A.D., Germanicus himself believed that he was the victim of foul play, for on his deathbed he charged his friends to prosecute Piso and Plancina, and his friends determined that he should be avenged. Agrippina, with her children and the ashes of her husband, immediately set sail for Rome. The staff of the dead prince chose C. Sentius Saturninus to take charge of Syria until a new governor should be appointed. Piso, however, determined to make a bold attempt to resume his command in that province, and for this purpose collected some troops in Cilicia. But Sentius was victorious in an engagement, and besieged Piso in the Cilician fortress of Selenderis. The ex-governor was finally forced to submit and take ship for Rome, where an unpleasant reception awaited him. The feelings of sympathy awakened by the death of Germanicus were intense both in the provinces and at Rome. Triumphal arches were erected in his honor, and his statues were set up in cities. Inscriptions recorded that he had died for the Republic. Correspondingly bitter was the rage felt against Piso and Plancina, who were generally believed to have been guilty. Nor were there wanting hints and murmurs that Tiberius himself and Livia were privy to the supposed crime of Piso and Plancina. It was thought that Tiberius regarded his nephew with jealousy and hatred, and rejoiced at his death and it was apparently this idea that encouraged Piso to act as he had done. The reserve of Tiberius in regard to the funeral ceremonies of Germanicus, at which he and Livia were not present, was interpreted in the same way, and the emperor even went so far as to show displeasure at the excess of the public lamentations. He issued a characteristic edict, enjoining on the people to observe some moderation in their sorrow. Princes are mortal, the republic is eternal. Resume your business, resume your pleasures, he added, for the Megalesian games approached. By this contempt for popular sentiment, Tiberius, it has been remarked, was sowing the seeds of a long and deep misunderstanding between himself and his people. Men contrasted the behavior of Augustus on the death of Drusus. But the emperor had no intention of protecting Piso, who had been guilty of the serious offense of trying to recover a province from which he had been dismissed by a superior in authority. The friends of Germanicus vied in undertaking the prosecution, but it was hard to find advocates to plead the cause of Piso. His friends wished the accused to come before the tribunal of the emperor, but Tiberius did not like to undertake the decision of such a delicate case, and he referred the judgment of it to the Senate. He opened the proceedings in the Senate House in a very impartial speech, the charges of political misconduct were clearly proven, but the charge of having made attempts on the life of Germanicus by magic and poison broke down. The senators, however, who in general sympathized with Germanicus, felt convinced that the prince's death had been due to foul play, while the political offenses of the culprit weighed with Tiberius. At the close of the second day of the trial, Piso saw in the cold look of the emperor that his doom was fixed. His conclusion was confirmed by the behavior of his wife Plancina, who had pleaded for him with the Empress Livia, but, as his chance of escape seemed to grow less, tried to sever her own cause from his. He anticipated the sentence by piercing his throat with his sword. The Senate expunged his name from the Fasti and banished his eldest son for ten years, but Tiberius interfered to mitigate the sentence of the Senate, and conceded Piso's property to his son. 
the influence of Livia shielded Plancina from prosecution. Thus ended a domestic tragedy. It must be observed that even if it were certain that Germanicus was the victim of foul play, there is not the smallest reason to suspect that the emperor was in any way concerned, as malicious rumors hinted. But there is no proof, and there can be no certainty, that the death of Germanicus was brought about by unfair practices of Piso or his wife. Another malicious report which gained belief was that Piso had not died by his own hand, but had been assassinated by the orders of the emperor. The qualities of Germanicus have been painted in such bright colors by the great Roman historian who has recorded his career, that we cannot help feeling deeply prepossessed in his favor. He appears as one of the ideal heroes who die young. But it is not clear that he would have become a great man if he had lived. His exploits have been exaggerated by the enthusiasm of his admirers. Tacitus, with more regard to art than truth, has selected him as the brilliant hero to set beside the dark figure of Tiberius. Germanicus is generous and virtuous, Tiberius suspicious and stained with crime. The uncle is the ideal tyrant, the nephew is the magnanimous prince. This picture of Tacitus in some measure reflects the general feeling which seems to have prevailed on the death of the popular Germanicus. Tiberius was misunderstood and maligned. The virtues of the son of Drusus were exaggerated. In the year 16 A.D. a plot was detected, which, though not of a formidable nature, attracted considerable attention. It shows that there was dissatisfaction in patrician circles, and illustrates the character of Tiberius. A young man named Libo Drusus, of the Scribonian family, was accused of revolutionary projects. Scribonia, the second wife of Augustus, was his great-aunt, Livia was his aunt, and he was the grandson of Sextus Pompeius through his mother. These connections with the imperial house seem to have turned his brain and suggested perilous ideas, which were encouraged by a senator named Fermius Catus, who was his intimate friend. Catus induced him to consult Chaldean astrologers and dabble in magic rites, practices which were then very dangerous, as they were regarded as a presumption of treasonable designs. He also treacherously led Drusus into extravagance and debt. Having collected sufficient proofs of guilt, Catus sent a messenger to the emperor, craving an audience and mentioning the name of the accused. Tiberius refused the request, saying that any further communications might be conveyed to him in the same way. Meanwhile, he distinguished his cousin Libo by conferring the praetorship on him, and often inviting him to table, showing no unfriendliness either in word or look, but he kept himself carefully informed of the daily conduct of the suspected man. At length, a certain Junius, whom Libo had tampered with for the purpose of invoking the dead by incantations, gave information to a noted informer, Fulcinius Trio, who immediately went to the consuls and demanded an investigation before the Senate. Libo, meanwhile, knowing his peril, arrayed himself in mourning, and accompanied by some ladies of high rank, went round the houses of his relatives entreating their intervention. But all refused on various pretexts. When the Senate met, Tiberius read out the indictment and the accusers' names with such calmness as to seem neither to soften nor to aggravate the charges. Some of them were of a ridiculous nature. For example, he was accused of having considered whether he would ever have wealth enough to cover the Appian Road as far as Brundusium with money. But there was one paper in which the names of Caesars and Senators occurred with mysterious and therefore suspicious signs annexed. Libo denied the handwriting, and the slaves who professed to recognize it were examined by torture. As an old decree of the Senate forbade the evidence of slaves to be taken in cases affecting their master's life, Tiberius evaded the law by ordering the slaves to be sold singly to the actor publicus, or agent of the errarium, so that Libo might be tried on their testimony. The accused begged for an adjournment till the following day. On going home he committed suicide, seeing that his case was hopeless. Tiberius said that he would have interceded for him, guilty though he was, if he had not destroyed himself. Libo's property was divided among the accusers, and some of the senators proposed decrees of reflecting on his memory. For example, that no Scribonian should bear the name of Drusus, in order to please Tiberius. Days of public thanksgiving were appointed, and it was decreed that the day on which Libo killed himself should be observed as a festival. Such sycophancy on the part of the Senate became in later times a matter of course. Section 4. Rebellions in the Provinces and Dependencies We must glance at the troublesome, though unimportant war, which was waged at this time on the southern borders of the empire, 
and at the career of Tacfarinus, who played in Africa the same part which the more famous Arminius played in the north. This Numidian had served in the Roman army, and had thus gained a knowledge of Roman discipline and military science. He then deserted, placed himself at the head of a band of robbers, and was finally elected as their leader by the Musulami, who dwelt on the southern side of Mount Orasius. The insurrection was not confined to these peoples of Numidia. It spread westward into Mauritania and eastward to the Garamantes. The discipline and drill which Tacfarinus enforced rendered the rising formidable, for his organized bands were able to give battle and attempt sieges. The commanders whom the Senate elected by lot were incompetent to deal with the insurgents, and the resulting war was protracted for seven years, 17 to 24 A.D. The single legion which protected Africa was reinforced by a second from Pannonia, and by the emperor's intervention an able proconsul, Q. Junius Blessus, was at length appointed. Tacfarinus had demanded from Tiberius a grant of territory for himself and his rebel army. Tiberius haughtily refused, and instructed Blasus to hold out to other chiefs who supported Tacfarinus the prospect of a free pardon if they laid down their arms. Many surrendered, and then Blasus attempted to meet Tacfarinus by tactics similar to his own. He divided his army into three columns, one of which he dispatched eastward under Cornelius Scipio to act against the Garamantes and protect Leptis. In the west, the son of Blasus commanded a second column and defended the territory of Sirta, while in the center Blessus himself established a number of fortified positions, and thus embarrassed the enemy, who found wherever he turned Roman soldiers in his face or on his flank or in his rear. When summer was over, Blessus continued hostilities, and by a skillful combination of forts and flying detachments of picked men, who were acquainted with the desert, he drove Tacfarinus back step by step, and finally captured his brother and occupied the district of the Musulami, 22 A.D., Tiberius permitted the triumphal ornaments to be awarded to Blasus, and also granted him the distinction of being greeted imperator by the troops, the last occasion on which this honor was granted to a private person. But even the success of Blasus was not the end of the insurrection. There were three laureled statues at Rome for victories over the Musulamian chief, those of Camillus, Apronius, and Blasus, and yet he was still ravaging Africa, supported on the one hand by the king of the Garamantes, on the other by the Moors. His boldness was increased by the circumstance that after the campaign of Blessus, the Ninth Legion had been recalled from Africa. In 24 A.D. he laid siege to Thubersicum, a Numidian town lying a little to the north of Mount Orasius. The proconsul of the year, Publius Dolabella, immediately collected all his troops and raised the siege. Knowing by the experience of previous campaigns that it was useless to concentrate his heavy troops against an enemy which practiced such desultory warfare as Tacfarinus, Dolabella adopted the plan of Blessus and divided his forces into four columns. He also obtained reinforcements from Ptolemy, king of the Mauritanians. Presently he was informed that the Numidian marauders had taken up a position close to Ozea, Omale, a dilapidated fort surrounded by vast forests. Some light-armed infantry and squadrons of horse were immediately hurried to the place, without being told whither they were going. At daybreak they fell upon the drowsy barbarians who had no means of flight, as their horses were tethered or pasturing at a distance. The dispositions of the Romans were so complete that the enemies were slaughtered or captured without difficulty. The general was anxious to capture Tacfarinus, but that chieftain, driven to bay, escaped captivity by rushing on the weapons of his assailants. His death ended this tedious war. During this period there were also grave disturbances in Gaul and Thrace. In Gaul the fiscal exactions had led to heavy accumulations of debt among the provincials, and the creditors pressed for payment. The provincials resorted to councils of despair. A conspiracy was formed to organize a rebellion throughout the whole land and throw off the Roman yoke. The leaders were Julius Florus and Julius Sacrovir, two Romanized provincials. Florus undertook to gain over the Belgae and Treveri, while Sacrovir, who perhaps held some priestly office, intrigued among the Edui and other tribes. The secret was well kept, and the revolt broke out in western Gaul in the consulship of Tiberius and Drusus, 21 A.D. But the first rising was premature. The Andecavi and the Turones, whose names still live in Anjou and Tours, moved too soon, and were crushed by the garrison of Lugudunum, 
under Asilius Aviola, the legatus of Lugudinensis. This false move put the Romans on their guard, and the subsequent risings of the Treveri were easily foiled by the governors of the two Germanic provinces. Florus slew himself to escape capture. The Adui had seized the important city of Augustodunum, Autun, but they too were easily defeated by C. Silius, legatus of Upper Germany, at the twelfth milestone from that town. Sacrever escaped from the field to a neighboring villa, where he fell by his own hand, and his faithful comrades slew one another, having first set fire to the house. A triumphal arch was erected at Orasio, Orange, to commemorate the defeat of Sacrever. The dependent kingdom of Thrace, after the death of Rometalces, who had loyally stood by the Romans in the Dalmatian revolt, was divided between his brother Rascaporis and his son Cotus. Their jealousies and feuds, which ended in the murder of Cotus, led to Roman interference and the execution of his uncle, 19 A.D. Two years later, a formidable insurrection of the western tribes broke out. The rebels besieged Philippopolis, but were defeated by P. Vileus, the governor of Moesia. They rebelled again in 25 A.D., and of this rising we have more details. The mountaineers refused to submit to levies and to supply their bravest men to the armies of Rome. A rumor had spread that they were to be dragged from their own land to distant provinces, so that mixed with other nations they might lose their own nationality. They sent envoys to the governor of Achaia and Macedonia, Papaeus Sabinus, assuring him of their fidelity, if no fresh burden were laid upon them. Otherwise they gave him to understand that they would fight for their freedom. He gave mild answers until he had completed his preparations, but when he had concentrated his forces and was joined by a legion from Moesia and reinforcements from Rembontalces, son of Rascaporis, he advanced on the rebels who had taken up a position in some wooded defiles in the mountains, in the neighborhood of a strong fortress. Sabinus fortified a camp and occupied with a strong detachment a long, narrow mountain ridge which stretched as far as the enemy's fortress, which it was his object to capture. After some skirmishing in front of the stronghold, Sabinus moved his camp nearer, but left his Thracian allies in the former entrenchments, with strict injunctions to pass the night vigilantly within the camp, while they might harry and plunder as much as they wished in the daytime. Having observed this command for some time, they began to neglect their watches, and gave themselves up to the enjoyment of wine and sleep. Learning this, the insurgents formed two bands, of which one was to surprise the pillagers, the other to attack the Roman camp, in order to distract the attention of the soldiers. The plan was successful, and the Thracian auxiliaries were massacred. Sabinus then laid regular siege to the stronghold, and connected his positions with a ditch and a rampart. The besieged suffered terribly from thirst, and their cattle were dying for want of fodder. The air of the place was polluted with the stench of the rotting carcasses of those who had perished by wounds or thirst. In this situation, many followed the advice and example of an old man named Dimis, who surrendered himself with his wife and children to the Romans. But two young chieftains named Tarsa and Tarissus had determined to die for their freedom. Tarsa plunged his sword in his heart, and a few others did likewise but Teresus and his followers decided to prolong the struggle, and planned a night attack on the camp during a storm. Sabinus was prepared, and the brave barbarians were beaten back and compelled to surrender. The triumphal ornaments were decreed to Sabinus, 26 A.D. Against a revolt of tributaries on the northern boundary of the empire, the arms of Rome were not so successful. The Frisians, who had been subdued by Drusus in 12 B.C., had for forty years paid the tribute which he imposed on them. This tribute consisted in ox-hides, which were required for military purposes, and officers who levied it never examined too curiously the size or thickness of the skins, until in 28 A.D. Olenius, a primipillar centurion, who was appointed to exact the tribute, chose the hides of wild bulls as the standard. As the domestic cattle of the Germans were of small size, the Frisians found this innovation hard. In order to meet the demands of Olenius, they were forced to give up first their cattle, then their lands, finally to surrender their wives and children as pledges. As their complaints led to no redress, they rose in revolt. The soldiers who were collecting the tribute were impaled on gibbets, and Alenius himself was obliged to flee to the fortress of Flavum, probably in the island of the same name, now Fleeland, near the Texel, which was a Roman coast guard station. 
When the news reached L. Apronius, the governor of Lower Germany, he summoned some veteran legionaries and chose auxiliaries from the upper province to reinforce his own legions, with which he sailed down the Rhine and relieved Flavum, which the Frisians were besieging. He then constructed roads and bridges over the adjoining estuaries in order to transport his legionaries into the heart of the Frisian territory, and in the meantime sent some auxiliary cavalry and infantry across by a ford to take the enemy in the rear. The Frisians beat these forces back. More cohorts and squadrons were sent to the rescue, but these too were repulsed, and soon all the auxiliary forces were engaged. The legions were at length able to intervene and just save the cohorts and cavalry, who were completely exhausted. A large number of officers had fallen, but Apronius did not attempt to take vengeance or even to bury the dead. Two other disasters completed the ill luck of the Romans. Nine hundred soldiers were destroyed by the enemy in the wood of Baduhenna, and another body of four hundred, who had taken possession of a country house, perished by mutual slaughter, to avoid falling into the hands of the enemy. No further steps seemed to have been taken against the Frisians. These events probably confirmed Tiberius in his determination to regard the Rhine as the limit of the Roman Empire, and he thought it a good opportunity to abandon the last relic of the conquests of his brother beyond that river. The reign of Tiberius was very nearly being marked by a slave war in southern Italy, but by a lucky accident the movement was crushed in its very beginning, 24 A.D. The organizer of the rebellion was Titus Curtisius, who had once been a Praetorian soldier. He held secret meetings at Brundusium and other towns in the neighborhood, then posted up placards, and incited the slave population in Calabria and Apulia to assert their liberty. Three vessels happened to come to land just then, and from them the quaestor Curtius Lupus, who had charge of the saltus, or forests and pastures in those parts, obtained a force of marines and crushed the conspiracy. Cortisius and his chief accomplices were sent prisoners to Rome, where, says Tacitus, men already felt alarm at the enormous number of the slave population, which was ever increasing, while the freeborn population grew less every day. The great marvel is that combinations among the slaves were not more common, and that it was not thought necessary to keep considerable garrisons in the towns of Italy to meet such emergencies. End of chapter 12, section 4 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 21, 2009.